55 years. As a 100% pro life OBGYN. And as a congressman whose service spans three and a half decades. A champion of liberty and a man of courage, he fought against every bailout. He fought against every deficit. He fought against every government intrusion into health care, whether Obamacare or the prescription drug plan or giving money to Planned Parenthood. He warned of the dangers of the Fed years ago, virtually alone, when our savings accounts still earned interest. And he warned of the housing bubble and the market collapse long ago, when we could have prevented them both. And most importantly, like Ronald Reagan, who brought the Soviets to their knees without firing a shot or sacrificing a single one of our freedoms, this man has refused to accept that we must buy our security at the price of our liberty. Please join me in giving a big Kansas welcome to a consistent conservative and a man of liberty, Congressman Dr. Before I start, I'd like to introduce my wife of 55 years, Carol, sitting up Yay, there. Carol! And we have 18 grandchildren. We brought two of them with us, Linda and Lisa. What a wonderful opportunity to come visit with some people who are asking me to expand the size of government. Yeah, this year, on January 1st, uh, it wasn't a very good year for those of us who like less government because uh, 40,000 new laws went into effect on January 1st. So I'm looking for the opportunity, if I am to be your president, I'd like to eliminate 40,000 laws. You know, the Federal Register expands uh, exponentially, regardless of who's in office, but I would like to be the very first president that actually shrunk the Federal Register. Thank you! First, to do that, to do that, we have to uh, reassess what our government's supposed to be doing. You know, we had a revolution uh, way back because we didn't, uh, our founders didn't like what the king was doing. And they wanted to shrink the government, and uh, they did. And they said the government should be uh, very limited. And it was to be limited for the sole purpose of protecting our liberty, not to run our lives and spend our money. It was to be keep a very small government. If you were to have any government of significance, it would be local, it wouldn't come from the federal government, and it certainly wouldn't come from the United Nations either. economic crisis. It's not just in the United States, it's worldwide, but we're very much involved. 
And the bubble is bigger than ever before. And it's mainly related to the monetary system because since 1971, our dollar has had no relationship at all to anything of real value. That is when the last vestige of the gold standard was removed in 1971, the time I was convinced that government would grow exponentially. And it, it, it actually motivated me to run for Congress in the 1970s because of the size and scope of government. Now what has it led to? It's led to a government that's out of control, the spending is out of control. We have failed to follow the admonition that you know of Jefferson, that uh, you know our, li our, our lives and our liberties come from our creator, not the government. Yeah. right to our lives and a right to our liberty. We're supposed to have a right to the fruits of our labor. That's what we're supposed to have. If we truly own our own lives, that means that we have a right to lead a life as we so choose and we would be able to spend our money as we choose. Today, though, because the government is so big and the Federal Reserve exists and, and buys all the debt and that there's no limits to the uh, spending of government, we now have this uh, worldwide phenomenon where we were able to print the money, steal armor, and others would take it as if it were gold and it isn't and it's coming to an end. That's what these last four years have signaled. Yes, we'd uh, inflate and spend our way out of some of the recessions, but this one isn't working. It was expected, it was predictable. We're in this mess, and guess what I believe is the absolutely necessary thing to do to get, back, get this back in order? That is, cut the spending. You have to So the first year, I'd like to start off with a token effort at cutting like one trillion dollars. But what have they been talking about? What have the other candidates talked about? Yeah, they talk about a little bit of cutting. People in Washington talk about cutting. Uh, the administration talks about cutting. But guess what? It's all deception. They're not talking about cutting anything other than the proposed increases. They have accepted the notion that we have baseline budget, which means all our spending automatically goes up for the next 10 years to the tune of about $10.5 trillion. Automatically increase. So if they cut a $10 trillion increase by $1 trillion over 10 years, they say they've cut something. <laughs> and people yell and scream and say, oh my goodness, they're, you know, they're ruining the budget, they're cutting everything, but they're cutting $1 trillion out of 10 over 10 years. That's a hundred billion dollars a year. Guess what? Our national debt is going up at on the average a hundred billion dollars every month. And in February of this year, we just finished February, it went up two hundred billion dollars. It's totally out of control and it won't last. And that is why fiscal conservatives has to come back into vogue. We as Republicans and conservatives have talked about it for a long time, but I don't think we live up to our promises. We've had some chances. But we've expanded the government when we've had been in charge. The national debt has gone up. We've doubled the size of the Department of Energy, the Department of Education. Now, I'm all for education, but to tell you what, from my understanding, there is no authority for the Department of Education. I mean, that's one of the ones I want to get rid of. The economic crisis has been building. Everybody knows about it for the last four years, but the economic statistics in the last 10 years are very bad. We had 132 million people employed 10 years ago. Guess what we have today? 132 million people employed. What, what happened? Well, that sounds good, yes, except there are 30 million new people in the country, which means that there have been no new jobs for those individuals, and they claim that the unemployment is between 8 and 9%. And most Americans don't quite understand that. How could things be so bad and the unemployment rate, you know, moderately bad? The truth is, it's not 8%. 
even if you look at the government statistics and start measuring those people who are underemployed or working one day a week, it comes out that the unemployment rate is 16%. Now, if you go to, if you go to a free market economist, who measures unemployment like they did in the past, the, the, the real unemployment is now 22%. And this is unsustainable, it just can't work. So the government gets, you know, we get into a recession, Keynesian economics teaches a, a recession comes because you, the people, won't spend your money. <laughs> but what if, what if you don't have any money in the bank? <laughs> What if you consumed your savings? What if you maxed out on your credit card? What if you lost your job? And they expect you to spend money. Well, they have a backup plan. Well, you won't spend the money because that's the only way you can stimulate an economy. The government is supposed to spend the money. But where, where are they going to get the money? They try to tax, but there's nothing left to tax. The economy is shrinking. Well, they can borrow, but they're afraid interest rates would go up. So then they have their fallback. We're going to spend money both in the Congress, and we're going to have money spent secretly by that secret organization called the Federal Reserve, and they're going to solve all our problems. Jefferson and Hamilton debated the issue. And uh, they went back and forth. We had a national bank early on, and Jefferson uh, got rid of the first national bank. And Andrew Jackson got rid of the second national bank. So this argument's been going on a long time. But the Constitution, if we had, you know, just a few more people in Washington that actually read the Constitution, uh, yeah. Yeah. They, would, uh, they would realize that the founders did their very best in trying to protect us against what was happening today. They said that there's no authority for a central bank, only gold and silver can be legal tender, and you can't print paper money. We wouldn't have this problem if, if we had followed the rules. And yet, we went off the rules in 1913, introduced this notion of an income tax. I mean, where, where did that idea come from? Hard work. So you'll know when the Republic has actually been returned to us when we repeal the 16th Amendment. Yeah. And also, also, next year, next year is the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Federal Reserve System. And, uh, and, and they have, uh, they have the dollar that they inherited in 1913 is now worth about three cents. So I would say let's celebrate next year with the passage of repeal the Federal Reserve Act. And then maybe we would get back to work again. But we'd have to do a few other things. We, uh, we have to cut spending. Uh, we have to cut the taxes. Uh, we have to deregulate. Every time there's a problem, they add on more regulations. You know, when, uh, when uh, Enron went bankrupt, Republicans were in charge, they gave us Sarbanes-Oxley. This added a trillion dollars worth of, uh, of uh, additional expense to business people uh, since that time, 10 years ago, approximately 10 years ago. But now, what do we have with uh, the Democrats and Obama and uh, Dodd-Frank and Obamacare? More and more, and then they wonder why people don't invest their money and take a little risk in making money when they can't even figure out what the regulations are going to do. So we need to deregulate. A lot of people get nervous, and the opposition said, oh, you would just have chaos, no regulations. No, we would have regulation by the market, by property rights, contract rights, bankruptcy law. <laughs> You know, they worried about having a depression, and uh, the bubble was there, it was predictable, the bubble burst, and those who were making a lot of money during the phase, uh, uh, the, the bubble phase, they're the ones who come screaming to the government and say, we're too big to fail, you have to bail us out or there'll be a depression. Congress and the Federal Reserve, to the tune of trillions of dollars, bailed them out. Now guess what happened? There was too much debt, it was, it was worthless, they couldn't sell it, or they'd have to go bankrupt. So what happened? 
the Congress and the Federal Reserve bought up all that wonderful debt and dumped it on the American taxpayer. And that's why we have this money. So this is, a, this is a system where if you have the free market, those who get exposed for whatever reason, if they go bankrupt, they should go bankrupt. In order to get growth again, is you have to have a cleansing or an elimination of bad debt. You as an individual, if you're in your head with, with debt and you're living way beyond your means, you have to cut back, you have to sell assets, maybe get another job, pay down your debt, and then maybe you'll get healthy growth again. <laughs> A nation is exactly the same way and we refuse to admit it. That yeah. A nation that lives beyond its means is forced to live beneath its means and that is what's happening. The big question is, is how long is this going to go on? If we continue to do what we're doing right now, propping up bad debt, regulating more, keep the taxes going, keep the same monetary system, this will be prolonged. It's going on five years right now. Japan did the same thing, and it's 20 years, and they're still in big trouble. Europe is in worse shape than us, and we're guaranteed we're gonna be like Europe. So it won't work. It is the conservatives, those limited government people that have to stand up and say, enough is enough. We won't stand for it anymore. We want our country back, we want our republic, and we want to be able to spend our own money. The basis of a free society is respect for life, and um, Jefferson was very clear on this, that life was precious, life came from our Creator, it did not come from our government, and we need to understand that. You know, about, about 40 years ago, the respect for life dropped off rapidly, especially in the 1960s. Respect for life was greatly diminished and that ushered in the age of abortion and careless attitude. And I have maintained constantly over the many years uh, that to defend liberty, which I do, I defend personal liberty, I defend economic liberty, I defend your right to your life because you have been given your life and your obligation to take care of your life. But if you don't have respect for life, how can you defend liberty? That is the reason that we must Assume that the life, the preborn life, has rights just as the born life. As a physician, I was very much aware of that. I can remember as a medical student before abortion was even considered, uh, the statement made to me was, well, if you're taking care of a pregnant woman, you have two patients. And lo and behold, that's exactly true, because even legally, and today, even with all the abortions, that legally I have an obligation, if I give a medication to a mother and hurts the fetus, I'm in big trouble, I'm, it's malpractice. So the, 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 the unborn have rights, they have inheritance rights, they can't be injured, but all of a sudden it's arbitrary. Oh, we don't want this life, so therefore we can dispose of this life. And I think that we have to have a lot more respect for life. But I'm also convinced that more laws alone won't make the, they make the case. The states have the right to write the laws and, and do what they need to diminish the amount of abortions done. But in the 60s, the laws were very strict. You we weren't allowed to do them. But I was doing my training and saw in the same hospital I worked in, they were doing abortions. So it was the attitude that changed, the moral standards of the change that changed in this country. Whether, you know, in the 60s, the Vietnam War was going on, it was very destructive. We had, uh, you know, the drug culture, the abortion culture, and, and all this. So then the laws were changed in the 70s. So though it might be easy to say, well, just pass more laws, more laws, but really there's a lot of responsibility by the individual and the morality of our society that will make the difference. very explicit after the uh, Constitution was written. He said that it will only last if the people remain a moral people. The Constitution... <laughs> the Constitution was not a perfect document. It was a very good document, but he said it depended on the people. 
So we still have to deal with that. And uh, this is where I think we come up short. So we can complain. I complain more than anybody else probably about what the president's doing, what the Congress is doing, what the judicial system is doing, especially what the bureaucrats are doing, because they shouldn't be doing anything. Too often, government reflects the people. That is why I have been so happy to identify closely with, especially the beginning of the Tea Party movement, because this was a group of people who want to stand up and say, enough is enough. You've been telling us stories all along, and we put one person in, and they do the same thing. You put another one in, the same thing again. And I've been uh, annoyed by that, too, because I, I think we should have a, a much better foreign policy. Yeah. I think we should only go to war with the Declaration of War. But some people think that's that's pretty old-fashioned, especially this administration. <laughs> you know? uh, but then again, I guess we can't challenge him because I would like to see a lot more peace and a lot less war. But since our president has won the Nobel Prize for Peace, I guess we're not allowed to be critical of him. <laughs> but uh, no, we uh, we need to reassess all those values. Uh, and uh, have, have a different policy because the, the money spent on our foreign policy is another issue. Our national debt went up $4 trillion because of these wars that we have been fighting. But this very week, uh, Panetta was before a Senate committee. Anybody see that video on Panetta? Yeah! yeah. I mean, this, this is astounding, but uh, thank goodness for the Senator Jeff Sessions, who was there. Yeah. But uh, Panetta was essentially saying that, well, I, uh, they were talking about Syria and other places going in without congressional approval. He says, but we get approval from uh, NATO and the United Nations. Thank goodness the session was in there. He said, when did this happen? You know, uh, what, what's going on here? And when Panetta was pushed, he says, oh, we will inform the Congress. I think they had things a bit twisted. Yeah! Dictator. He's not a king. He can't take us to war without a declaration. He shouldn't be declaring that he can kill American citizens, assassinate American citizens. He yeah. shouldn't be able to write law. I mean, Congress can write the law. The executive branch has been writing these regulations. They have the form of law. But what in addition to the executive orders? Now, there's a few executive orders the president is authorized to carry out his constitutional function. But a couple weeks ago, he was frustrated with the Congress not passing some rigid uh, environmental laws. He said, it doesn't matter, I'll just write an executive order to do it. This is not the way it was supposed to be. He, he is not to be a dictator. And uh, this is the reason the American people have to wake up and have to say, enough is enough. And we have to live within the confines of the Constitution and defend the Constitution and send only people to Washington who will do so. Yeah. But unfortunately, we keep moving in this uh, in, in the wrong direction because the, even the Congress gave the authority to the president to arrest American citizens. Now, arrest American citizens by the U.S. by the U.S. Army, and no charges made, no attorney, no trial, secret prison, indefinite detention for American citizens. The Republic cannot exist without that bill and many others being repealed. Yeah. Executive orders are legal, most of them are illegal, but I do believe a constitutional president can use an executive order to repeal executive orders. <laughs> about and what has led to the Tea Party movement has been the frustration with the status quo. 
I had frequently said my opponents very often are representatives of the status quo. They're, they're talking about continuing the same foreign policy. They're not talking about changing the monetary policy. They're not talking about real cuts. They're not interested in re repealing the Patriot Act, which is an abuse of our Fourth Amendment rights. and responsibility for the individual. Freedom has produced the freest, our freedom in this country has produced the most prosperous country ever and the freest country. And we've had the largest middle class. But today, it doesn't exist. The middle class is shrinking. Wealth is being transferred from the middle class to the super wealthy. So there is some truth about this 99.9, business. But we don't condemn everybody who makes money, just the ones who make the money by ripping us off by getting money from the Federal Reserve and the bailouts. It did well. We gave up on it. We became more interested in the materialism that is produced by freedom. And we have lost our way because we're not producers anymore. The jobs have gone overseas and we are living off debt. So it has to be reassessed. And the experiment of freedom is going to exhaust itself if we continue to do this. And this is the reason that we have to state very clearly what we believe in, and that is our individual freedom. What made America great? The experiment should not die. And for those who tell you you want to go back to the Dark Ages, let, let them know that the Dark Ages was tyranny and big government. It's been around for 6,000 years. We've only had a small taste of liberty, and we like to taste. We're not going to let it go. We are going to defend the cause of liberty and work for peace and prosperity.